In this lecture, we continue our brief overview of molecular orbital theory with a look at transition metal complexes that have octahedral and tetrahedral symmetry. And so let's think about, as a model system, this complex ion, chromium hexachloride 3 minus. The first thing to figure out which atomic orbitals we need to include to make up our molecular orbitals. And going back to the hydrogen helium example, we're going to get the most interaction between orbitals that are similar in energy. So if we look at the energies of the valence orbitals on chlorine, we can see that the 3s orbital is about minus 29 electron volts, and the 3p orbital is more like 13 to 14 electron volts. In our table of orbital energies from last lecture, we didn't have chromium on there, but we can interpolate between titanium and zinc to come up with an estimate of the orbital energies for chromium. And when we do that, you can see that we expect the 3d orbitals to be, I don't know, minus 12, minus 13 electron volts. Very close in energy to the 3p orbitals on chlorine. And then the 4s are going to be higher in energy. And the 4p, which don't even show up here, would be higher still. And so what this is going to allow us to do is to simplify things. Let's treat the 3s orbitals on chlorine like core orbitals. So now we only have to deal with the 3p orbitals. There's three of those per chlorine. There's six chlorines in this molecule. So that's 18 chlorine 3p atomic orbitals that are going to be in our molecular orbital diagram. And then for the central chromium, we're going to include all nine valence orbitals. Five d orbitals, one s orbital, and three p orbitals. Okay, let's do the electron counting here. So what about for the ligand? Well, chlorine has a 3s2, 3p5 electron configuration. We're taking the s orbitals out of the picture. We're treating those as core electrons. So we're only going to count the p electrons on chlorine here. 6 times 5 is 30 electrons from chlorine. Chromium has 6 valence electrons. And then the charge on this complex ion is 3 minus. So there's going to be a total of 39 valence electrons in this complex ion. OK, so now what we want to do is take those 9 orbitals on the central chromium, and then try and find ligand salks that have the right symmetry to mix with them, and see where that takes us. We have the 4s orbital on chromium, and we can draw a ligand salk where all of the p orbital lobes are pointing toward the center, and all with the same phase. And that can form a, a bonding molecular orbital and an antibonding molecular orbital. In these drawings, I'm only showing the atoms that are in the xy plane of the molecule. So I'm taking off the chlorines that would be above and below, just so we can see it better. But if I were to include those, all six chlorines would have the same lobe pointing in at the central chromium. So we get a bonding and an antibonding MO from that. Here, another ligand salk that has the right symmetry to mix with d x squared minus y squared orbital on the central chromium to give bonding and antibonding combinations. I haven't drawn it, but we can get the same thing if we include the dz squared orbital on the central chlorine. So those give sigma and sigma bonding interactions. The p orbitals on chlorine can mix with ligand salts that look like this to give us bonding and antibonding combinations. And then finally, we can also think about the dxy, dxz, and dyz orbitals, which can mix with ligand salics like this to give a pi bonding MO and a pi antibonding MO. Remember that the difference between a sigma bond and a pi bond is in a pi bond, there's a nodal plane that cuts through the internuclear axis. Now, let's stop and count up how many orbitals we've used here. Well, the ones that have a T label are triply degenerate. The ones that have an E label are doubly degenerate. And the ones that have an A or a B label are singly degenerate. So we've used 3, 6, 8, 9. We've used 9 chromium orbitals and 9 ligand salks. 
there were only nine orbitals on chromium to begin with. So we've used all of the chromium orbitals up, but we've only used half of the 18 chlorine-based salks. And what are the others? Well, the others are shown here. Two of these, the T1G and the T2U, um, the P orbitals are oriented perpendicular to the bonds. And if you looked at these symmetries for a minute, you would quickly realize that there is no orbital on the central chromium that can overlap in a, either a bonding or an antibonding way with these orbitals. So these are strictly non-bonding chlorine salks. This other one here, the T1U, if you remember from the last slide, we did see T1U for the chromium 3P orbitals and a ligand salk, and, and these could have an interaction with the chromium 3P orbitals. So this one, it can mix in with the others, but we're going to treat it largely as non-bonding. The one I drew on the last slide was sigma bonding and pi bonding. This one, if we put a chromium 4D orbital in here, it would be, say, sigma bonding, pi antibonding. So those two kind of cancel each other out. Now in the MO diagram for this molecule, we can put all of this together, right? The 18 ligand salks that come from the chlorine, 3P orbitals, and the nine orbitals that come from the chromium. And we just saw that there's nine bonding MOs, which are shown down here, and then a corresponding nine antibonding MOs. In here, we have nine non-bonding MOs. Now, this looks like a pretty complicated diagram. But fortunately, most of the time, we're really only interested in the frontier orbitals. So when we have transition metals that have some d electrons still, almost all the action is going to happen in here. The inorganic chemists will probably recognize this T2G EG splitting of the d orbitals from crystal field theory. Okay? So these are the dxy, the dyz, the dxz. They're pi antibonding combinations with chlorine. And these two up here are the, the d orbitals that point directly at the ligands. That is the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared. All right, so this diagram is one that we're going to come back to over and over again through the course. What happens if we change the geometry to a tetrahedron, but we keep a transition metal in the center? As an example of this, let's consider the complex ion tetrachlorocobalt 2 minus. Now, here, once again, we can focus just really on the 3p orbitals of the chlorine. Now we have only four chlorines in the molecule, so we have 12 3p orbitals on chlorine that we have to consider. And we have the same nine orbitals on the central transition metal here at cobalt. Okay, so let's do the electron counting. Once again, each chlorine is going to bring five electrons in its p orbitals, so that's a total of 20 because there's four chlorines. A neutral cobalt atom has nine valence electrons, so that's another nine. And then the charge on this complex is two minus, so we have a total of 31 valence electrons. Now, if we think about the interactions of the S and the P orbitals on the central cobalt, well, we've already figured out that story. That overlap is going to be just the same as it was for methane, albeit with slightly different orbital energies here but we're going to end up with a bonding and an antibonding interaction from the S orbital and the ligands, and then a triply degenerate set of bonding and antibonding interactions of the P orbitals on the central atom with the ligands. What's new is thinking about the interactions of the D orbitals with the ligands. And a tetrahedron is a little trickier to envision than an octahedron. This drawing that I've done here is probably the way that I find it most intuitive to understand it. So if we draw a tetrahedron in a cube, that's a pretty good way to visualize it. These green spheres represent where we have a ligand. What we see is that the dx squared minus y squared orbital is pointing directly at the edges of the tetrahedron. And the dz squared is also pointing directly at the edges of the tetrahedron. And if you think about it, how could you orient yourself to be as far away as possible from the ligands? And as far away as possible would be toward the edges. 
So these two orbitals, the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared, have the smallest interaction with the ligands. The other orbitals, which are given the label T2, they don't point directly at the ligands, but then again, they don't also point directly between them. So they experience a greater repulsion from the ligands. Right? So they're going to have a greater degree of mixing with the chloride ligands. Ultimately, what that gives us is an MO diagram that looks like this. Nine bonding MOs, nine antibonding MOs, and now we have only three non-bonding ligand MOs because there are fewer ligands. Once again, the part we're normally most interested in is this right here, these antibonding interactions between the ligands and the D orbitals on the metal. The simplest thing to take away with respect to the octahedron is we have a splitting that is opposite. Now the dx squared minus y squared and the dz squared are lower in energy, still doubly degenerate, but lower in energy than the other three. So the splitting is reversed, and also the energy separation between these two orbitals is reduced. It's only about half as big, and the reason why is because in the octahedron, we could think of these as breaking cleanly into sigma antibonding and pi antibonding. But here, there are no orbitals that are purely sigma antibonding, and so that means that the energy separation here is less.